tonight. We're delighted to have you with us tonight. Welcome to our digital audience as well. Um, we're coming together on a very topical um, discussion. In our world, despite the advances of technology and commerce and enlightened thought, more people are displaced by conflict, conflict than ever before in recorded history. Um, the figures from the United Nations refugee report that was released last week are overwhelming. 65 million people have been forced from their homes by political violence and unrest, and that's not counting people who are displaced by natural disaster. The largest number come from Syria and Iraq, um, but those places are hardly alone in feeding this exodus. There's a surge of migrants coming from the Congo, from Somalia, from South Sudan, from Nigeria, Afghanistan, Haiti, and Colombia. 25 million people are taking refuge outside of their country. And the largest part of this flood are not coming to rest in Europe, as the press might have you believe, but in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan and Ethiopia. Along the way, in seeking safety, one in 20 people die. And nearly 100,000 children have attempted the journey on their own. This is the most staggering global crisis we have seen since World War II, and it's an existential one, one that calls into question the adequacy of many of our long-held thoughts and ideas, our ideas about welcome, about citizenship, about nation and borders, about Europe itself. And that seems clear with the shock of yesterday's news that Great Britain elected to leave the European Union, motivated in large part by a fear of open borders and untrammeled immigration. But of course, this is not just Europe's problem, it is ours too. And I don't just mean the economic uh, implications of Brexit. I'm thinking about the way that we are subject to the same forces um, that's been made clear in Donald Trump's xenophobic pro proclamations or this week's Supreme Court decision um, that about illegal searches that Justice Sonia Sotomayor described in her brave dissent as creating second-class citizens within our communities. It's been quite a week. And in a civic society, artists and writers and other creative producers play a critically important role in helping guide us through these complex situations. They function as seismic sensors of key shifts in thoughts and of barometers of the social and ethical stakes at play. And that's what tonight's conversation is about. It's part of our Citizens and Border Initiative, which is a series of discrete programs that are organized by curators and other program makers across the museum that are joined in offering perspectives on migration, territory, and displacement. The current exhibition of Bushra Khalili's revelatory mapping journey project is part of, part of the Citizens and Border Initiative. Um, it's organized by Stuart Comer and Gianpaolo Bianconi. It's going to be open um, up until October 10th. Another addition to our Citizens Border Initiative is Insecurities, an exhibition that will be opening um, on October 1st. It's organized by Sean Anderson in the Department of Architecture and Design, and will explore architecture in relationship to global refugee emergencies. So tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations, which is committed to global literacy. And together with the CFR, we welcome an extraordinary group of uh, individuals to our stage. The great artist Bushra Khalili herself, philosopher and professor of political science and great champion of open borders, Joe Karens. Bernard Hayek, who's a historian and commentator on political events, a specialist on Islamic law and political movements. And I'm afraid that I have some bad news as well, which is the extraordinary writer and activist Samar Yazbek can't join us. 
um, because of visa difficulties. Um, she travels on an official refugee status. Uh, she has a French passport with an official refugee pa uh, status and encountered difficulties and we weren't able to work through them in time. But she's very eager to join us tonight to address this audience and we're keen to have her. So we'll have her for a while, part of the program via Skype, and then we'll bring her back to the museum in the early fall when we can secure her visa. So that's a great disappointment, but I'm very glad she'll be able to join us uh, via technology. And the run of the program will be that everyone will come to stage. Bernard will begin the conversation with Samar on Skype. The discussion will be um, about 50 minutes. Then there'll be time for Q&A, about uh, 20 minutes of Q&A. You have cards in your program, and you can write any questions that come up during the conversation on your cards. And you can also send us questions with the hashtag citizensborders, and you can comment on the event that way as well. So thank you all for joining us. We're delighted to have you, and I'm looking forward to tonight's event. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, we have Samar here with us. I'm also being an academic, I got the books. Uh, and um, Samar has two wonderful books uh, that we'll be discussing uh, today, uh, among, other, among other issues. The first is uh, A Woman in the Crossfire, which is a book about her experience um, at the beginning of the Syrian uprising. And the second is The Crossing, which is um, the journey uh, from Syria, uh, out of Syria, and uh, because of the war. So, hello, Samar. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I will begin uh, the question by asking you um, the role of, of the artist in, uh, in talking about these conflicts, in uh, 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 you know, being a, being a witness to these conflicts, um, can you tell us something about about that about that role, and in, in, in particular, drawing from your own experiences? هل يمكن أن نعرف بدور بدور الفنان في الحديث عن الصراعات ووجوده كشاهد لهذه الصراعات؟ فهل يمكن أن تحكي لنا عن تجربتك بالنسبة لهذا الوضع كونك أنك أنت كونك كفنان وشاهد للصراعات الموجودة الآن؟ بداية هو الفن دائما ضد الموت وضد الحرب. I I believe like art is against death and against war. لكن في حالة معقدة مثل الوضع السوري التراجيدي. Regarding like that tragic uh, situation now in Syria, uh, uh, it's, uh, in this situation, it was very important to know the identity, the different aspects of the identity of the artist. Uh, it could be like different like aspects. It could be like um, a political activist, and it could be like an activist, or it could be like a witness for the truth. Uh, one of the most important things that came to me uh, at the beginning of the peaceful demonstrations in Syria around like five years ago. Uh, 
وان ينقل حقيقه الاحداث اللي بدات تروى على شكل مختلف الاعلام. I was I was on the front line at the beginning of all these demonstrations, and I was really very keen to try to convey the really true picture right from the beginning to the media. Even when I moved, like uh, when I went like to Paris, and then I went back again to the north in 2012. <laughs> Uh, uh, as as uh, as a writer and I as as a cultured person also, I was I was eager just to be a part of this change. Uh, and also in that case, I was just trying to document everything what it, uh, what's going on in the north and also to establish like a civil establishment. I, I was there in all of these areas that was under like bombardment uh, from the Assad regime. And I, I was, I was on the front line in all of these battlefields, whatever, even up till where is like all of this presence of the ISIS also, and until like I went back to Paris. And I have like really very horrible like stories about all of these people that really lost their lives. And they are the silent, like they are silent. All of these victims or, uh, and they have no sound, like they, no voice for them. They were really silent. And this is one of the role. This is one of the role of the artists during like wars or like dramatic changes in history. And this is at least from my perspective. If I if I may, one of the one of the issues that uh, or that actually unites a lot of the work that's being presented here. Um, is, is the rejection of the typical or the stereotypical framing of the conflict, whether in your case it's the uh, sectarian uh, way in which Syria is described as explaining all the problems, or uh, in, in the case of Bushra, you know, the idea that um, the stereotypical idea we have of the refugee um, is also uh, interrogated in your work. Uh, and, and is put into question. And I would like us perhaps to, to talk about how the artist actually, you know, shifts the focus on what uh, the problem is as it is defined, for example, in the media. Yes. Uh, I, uh, there is some, can uh, 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 من الموضوعات التي تعر التي نحن نتحد في موضوع نحن نرفض موضوع الخوض في موضوع الصراعات ولكن أيضا كان هناك أيضا في نوع من التغير بالنسبة لدور الدور الفنان في هذا الموضوع ولكننا نعرف منك من 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 سيادتكم ما هو التغير الذي احترق على دور الفنان في هذا الموضوع. Uh, after like in, in the situation of Syria, after it like it was like a battlefield for so many like parties uh, uh, parties in that field. Uh, 
it's very it's very important for the uh, artist himself to be part uh, or one of the tools of the change uh, but in, in my situation, of course, the, the, the arts, like the role of the arts, it was like really retreating in my situation, whatever was going on in Syria, was a little bit retreating. This is, relies on like the identities for each artist and what is the relation between him and the society. It's, it's, it was like really we should not like forget this about the fear uh, like uh, the fair case of the Syrian of the Syrian people. Uh, we as artists, we were part of this, like the demand for uh, democracy and demanding for peace, and we, we just was part of it as an artist. Uh, as I said, like also as a writer, also with so many identities, I should be like also, I was keen to have like really a part of that, about the change, what's going to happen in Syria, about the change in Syria. Uh, we should not really limit the function of the art because this is not like really, it's, it's limiting it is no good, like we should not really limit the role of the art. One of the most important thing really is to trying to convey the truth and to be the voice of all of the victims. Uh, because I, I, am, I am believing, of course, about the world media and also the uh, Syrian regime, of course, conveyed the wrong image of uh, what happened, what's going on in Syria. Uh, I, was, I was keen just to be part of the truth, just to bring justice for all the victims. Usha, do you see your role uh, in, sim in similar terms, that you're a witness to events, that you're trying to reframe how the media is, talks about refugees, for example? How do you see what, what you're doing? I think I see the, the things. I mean, I absolutely agree with uh, what Samar just said. And at the same time, I will speak from my own position that is quite different because I work within a different context. I'm not Syrian, and my experience is completely different. And an, an artist also work with one's own life and own experience. Um, so I, I, I won't define my work or myself as an artist as a witness, but rather as someone who tries to ask a question, to give the form to that question, and rather than speaking for the others, uh, giving that opportunity to individuals who are often silenced to speak for themselves mm -hmm. and with their own words. Um, but at the same time, it's also what Samar was saying about providing with different images. And you started, you started your question with the, with the comparison with the media. Mm -hmm. um, the media often 
produce images to illustrate a preconceived discourse. Mm -hmm. My position is somehow the, completely, the complete opposite of that. It's rather how one can ask a question rather than illustrating a solution mm -hmm. or a predefined or a, precon a preconceived discourse. So I, I don't see myself as someone bringing or proposing something that is complete, but rather um, asking a question um, to an audience and inviting an audience to reflect on the pictures that are shown and the words that are, that are said and not giving one solution, but rather uh, encouraging a dialogue and a, and a debate in a public space because a museum is also a public space. Yeah. It's a space for the public and consequently it can be a civic space as well. Um, so I, that's also the reason why I cannot define myself as an activist, but rather as a citizen, uh, which is a different position, um, but try to uh, look at images as something that can create a debate, a dialogue, another ways, uh, other ways of saying, and suggest other perspectives, but at the same time not imposing them, but rather suggesting them to, to, to the public and inviting the public to exercise this freedom of reacting to an artwork and reflecting for, for themselves through that artwork and eventually speaking of it with others. So the impact on reality is not direct, uh, but it participates in, a, in, in the public debate on how do we approach uh, very specific issues. Because at the same time, I also consider that I work on very specific and, uh, questions and with very singular trajectories that cannot become examples as opposed, again, to the, to the media. Often when they, uh, they give one minute or two minutes to someone to express himself or herself, that person is supposed to illustrate one specific case. Uh, but I don't believe that they are examples, that in individuals' trajectories are examples. They are what they are, they speak for themselves, and at the same time, they are universal. Mm -hmm. uh, they, but never examples. There is definitely a universality, and I know, Joe, you got, you got to see the installation earlier. Yes, indeed, yeah. And, and the, the story of, I mean, that seems to be universal, of people from so many different countries all trying to, you know, delineating their own itineraries on this, on this map. And, and there are all the ethical issues that arise. I mean, some of them end up almost enslaved in, in, in countries, in, in several different countries. And what we would normally think is a journey that would take, you know, 10 hours in a flight takes three years, four years yeah. sometimes to complete. I wonder what you, your sort of response, given the work you've done on refugees, on citizenship, on borders, how that, how that installation spoke to you. Well, I found it very powerful, uh, uh, and, and for precisely the reasons that Bouchard just said, that the kind of specificity, the tracking of the individuals. So it's a, uh, doing the sort of work that Bouchard does as an artist is different from the sort of work that I do as a philosopher. You know, we, we, uh, we, we paint pictures with words, uh, and not like novelists, but there is a way in which what you do as a philosopher is to try to construct a vision of the, of the world and to say, isn't it like this? So it's an appeal to a debate, but, but it's an attempt to use uh, reason and argument. So it's a, it's in that sense, it's a, it, I think there's less, uh, so I do try to tell some stories, and, and I actually think of them as examples. So there are some, <laughs> there are some tensions here, because I'm, I'm trying to seek generalization. So in a way, what I'm doing is quite different from Bushra because I do want to generalize. I, if one engages in a debate, then one wants to have an answer. So the question needs to be posed, and I think she's very effective at challenging the conventional questions. But then with the new question, we want to know, is that a better answer? What are your answers? What's the... So I'm interested in one of the best answers to the questions, and also in subverting the questions. So I'm, and I think Bushra's work does a terrific job of that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know that the, um, the medium that you chose, the medium that you chose is, so the, is uh, the, the map, and, and you don't see that you don't is see is the, the, the face of, of, of the individuals. Was there, I mean, I mean, was there a question in the in the chat? So I was wondering about the the you know the choices that you you made. 
uh, where, for instance, you chose not to show their faces, um, and you chose the map. And I know from uh, an article that was written about your work where you had shown or you had discussed this, ma this wonderful map, medieval Islamic map by Al Idrisi, I think, which shows Europe in the south uh, and, 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 and Africa in the north. So a total inversion. Um, it, why the map? Why did, why did you choose the map as this, or cartography, as a way of, of, of talking and describing the question uh, and the itinerary? I think my answer will be quite long. <laughs> <So> <laughs> um, there are basically, I would say, three reasons. Uh, the first one is what I have witnessed myself uh, when I was a teenager in Morocco. Um, it's quite ironic to speak of it today uh, on, on the Brexit day. Um, but I was in Morocco uh, when the Schengen Agreement was signed. And this had an immediate consequence on North Africans. Because before 91, it was easy to go to Europe. For Moroccans, Algerians, they, there was no need for, for a visa. And this completely changed at the moment when Europe was discussing the no, a no border area, but for Europe itself, mm -hmm. not for the others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, we became excluded from that area, from a ge precise geographical uh, area. For us, until 1901, the problem was not in getting a visa, it was in having a passport, because having a passport was a privilege. It was at the discretion of the, of the state, who could decide who, was, uh, who could have a passport and who cannot. Um, from 91, it became the opposite. It was easy to have a passport and extremely difficult to have a visa. Um, so I, I, I guess my interest in geography um, started also with this with a contemplation of uh, ancient Islamic uh, tradition of map making, because that's also what I was in contact with. Um, but also of, of my own experience of, of living in a country where suddenly we were banned to cross borders, uh, while the, the, the distance between northern Morocco and Spain is 14 kilometers. And not to mention the, the, the history of convivienza with Spain, you know, if, yes. if we don't go back to, to to back in history. So I, I, I guess the interest with geography started with this, with a perception, with a question of perception, and a sort of counter shot of that perception when I started to live myself as an immigrant in France. So I, I had somehow the counter view or, or the counter shot of being in that place that was refused to us before, um, and living there as someone who was not a citizen still. Uh, even though I could speak French fluently because, of course, the colonial history had an impact uh, on, on Morocco after the independence and until today. Uh, French is still a prominent language in Morocco. So it was not if I was suddenly living in a completely uh, unknown country. There was uh, like a cultural, uh, let's say, connection between both places. But still, I was not a citizen. I was a foreigner. And, I, I, and when I became an artist, of course, I also started to work with this, with my own experience, my own perception of, uh, of the question. And being an artist, the, the, when I, I start working on a project, I also start somehow formulating a question and how to give a visual shape to the question. A map is an image. Uh, it's a convention. It's an image. We all know map from atlas or from uh, books, etc. It's a familiar picture. It's, but what about if that picture is challenged uh, by real experiences? Uh, what about if that picture becomes a sort of surface on which a sort of counter map uh, can, be, can be drawn? So for me, it was very, I mean, the, the idea was very simple. I want to show something to someone. How can I show it? Because eventually, when one works with video or film, it's always about showing something to someone. It doesn't mean that showing that thing, you, you will say, it means this, or what is, this is what the picture is about. But you, you show something and you expect an answer. Um, and that's also why I chose a map. Because a map is also, by essence, deictic. Because it shows something. 
And when you, when you show a hand drawing on a map, it's also a performative and deictic gesture. Mm -hmm. You're showing something else. You're showing a sort of counter shot. So the idea of working with a map was somehow natural because of my own commitment with geography, uh, conceptual, um, but also cinematic in the sense that um, in one long shot, I had the shot and the counter shot. There was no need for technical editing. The editing was already there because of the different layers uh, that, uh, that are combined in that very minimal, uh, let's say, um, yeah, um, visual shape. And of course, the voice plays also a prominent aspect because it's not, I mean, it cannot be defined as voiceover because it's synchronized, uh, completely synchronized, it's direct sound. But that sound is also an image, and that's how the, the, the position of the viewer becomes extremely important because um, there is something that is being shown, and there is something that is being narrated, and they, they are all the pe peculiarities of one's voice, because every single voice is different. Uh, every single voice has a specific grain. Uh, there are accents. Uh, three of the videos are in, four of the, the videos are in Arabic, and they are different Arabic. Mm -hmm. So for an Arabic speaker, it's also challenging to also realize suddenly how diverse the, uh, the practice of Arabic can be in a region that is often pictured as completely homogeneous, mm -hmm. which is not true. Um, and I can um, like give more and more details on why every single thing is extremely specific, uh, but at the same time, very simple. The story of, of the, you know, of the intimate stranger, you know, the, in the case of the Moroccan or the North African who comes to Europe who speaks French, but yet is still having to be made into someone, an othering. This is a story that also comes out in, in, in your work where you see that these legal norms, when they're constructed, often there's something very contrived and arbitrary about them. And you have this wonderful story in, I mean, tragic story, actually, in the chapter on refugees where the, it's a story of Jewish refugees from the Holocaust who are not uh, allowed into the, into the United States and then the, the ship is sent back and presumably most of them perish in, in Europe. And the arguments that were being made at the time about, about these people, uh, which ring, I mean, there's almost an immediate and direct echo to how we hear, it, how we, you know, listen to people who are talking about Muslims or talking about um, people from the global south. Um, there's something so um, familiar about that, that voice uh, from, from the 30s and, and now again today. And I know that you were telling me earlier in your work that it seems that the situation is only getting worse uh, as you've been studying these issues over the last several decades. Um, why, why do you think that is? I mean, not just why is it getting worse, but why are these, these echoes, these trajectories so similar? I mean, why, why is it we never seem to learn to change how we talk about these, uh, these others? I wish I had an answer to that. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think it is, so first of all, I'm not a complete pessimist. I think these things shift and, and that uh, you do sometimes find an opening and a willingness to understand. And, uh, and I, I actually think a lot of these things are contingent, that it just depends on a set of circumstances and who makes an argument. I mean, uh, we just went through an election in Canada in which there was a right-wing party that was taking the kind of conventional anti-refugee and, and a, a liberal party, modest, kind of mainstream, but liberal party that said, no, we should take in more refugees. And mm -hmm. they won. They appealed. They said, isn't this who we are? So it's an appeal to a certain kind of identity. And, so, and that's what I try to do in the book, in the section on refugees. So if you ask people in North America, in, in Canada, and the United States, and most people in Europe about the history of the Holocaust, the lead up to the Holocaust, everyone would say, that was terrible, we failed, this was a terrible moral failure. And exactly right, the language, when you look at how people justified that at the time, how was it that they explained to themselves why it was all right to exclude Jewish refugees, why to deny them visas, why to accuse them of being smugglers, 
uh, and they, if they have this much money, they can make it to the, they can't really be in need. And all of the same arguments, they're dangerous. Some of them are communists. Some of them may be pretending to be, uh, they're actually Nazis, but they're pretending to be Jews. All of the same arguments that you hear today about why well, you have to be afraid of refugees were, were the arguments that were made in, at that time. And so I think there is, so my hope is that by drawing attention to that, people will come to see that there's something problematic about the kind of discourse that is dominating the discussion of refugees today. And, and I do think it's contingent that if enough people hear it and see it, that, you know, there's, you have both of these forces out there. There's a kind of open, you saw that in Germany, right? There was a very positive response to the refugees and then some negative things and then it, it is so flexible. It's not, it's not predetermined, it's not fixed. And it matters what, what uh, people say. Although the legal structures and the legal norms seem not to have been updated to deal with this reality, right. or at least the intensity of the refugee crisis right. that we're seeing today. And, you, and, and one of your pleas in the book is actually to, to, well, it, to, to work yes, on that. Yes and no. I mean, I think that if you said what would be the right frame to admit refugees, you would have a much more expansive definition. And, and indeed, again, you see some progress in that respect. So that, for example, the definition of refugee has been expanded to include persecution on the basis of gender, persecution on the basis of sexuality, and those are all positive developments, a kind of expanse. Those were not envisaged when they wrote the rules, but those were positive for recognizing that people can suffer. Them. But in other ways, it's been narrowed and, and constrained. And, and I do have to say that I would not, as a, if I were recommending to policymakers, I wouldn't recommend opening up the definition now because in this climate, what would happen is it would be narrowed further still. So, it, it, you know, although the definition as it currently exists is imperfect, if you try to make it better, you'll probably make it worse. So there's a difference between what you think is right in principle and what actions you have to take in the world. You have to think about the consequences of the actions. And are, are you still engaged in, in, in some of these issues around? I know that you, know, you don't really like to talk about the work you're doing, but are you still engaged in some of these questions, these big questions about identity, borders, citizenship, um, belonging? Well, somehow I, I, I always considered that my work was not necessarily about refugees or migrations. It was rather a sort of um, interrogation on what it means to be a citizen, including when the law doesn't give you the right to be a citizen. Is it, is, is it still possible to conceive a society where anyone can be a citizen? Or to say it in, in more simple words, uh, can we conceive citizenship not as an exclusive club, which membership is your ID card, uh, but something completely different that would be a commitment to a society. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be the, the only condition that uh, would be demanded by, by, by a state uh, to recognize someone as, as a citizen. Um, but to go back to your previous questions, if you ask the question of uh, in alternative forms of citizenship, you also interrogate necessarily the conception of nation state, what it means today. And I, I, I guess that the Mapping Journey project is also, also interrogates the status of, of nation state and what it means. And I, the Brexit somehow is, is a sort of victory of the, of the most right. conservative right. Uh, conception of what, it, what is a nation state as opposed to the European Union that was supposed to be an, an, not an addition, but a sort of coalition of nation states to somehow go over very restrictive uh, conceptions of belonging to the point of dreaming of a sort of European citizenship uh, that, won't, that won't only depend on every single state, but that would be more inclusive somehow. Um, and what we are seeing today is also the failure of that, the failure of that utopia um, so maybe my work is, is eventually about this utopia of citizenship not linked to nation state, but to other forms of belonging. Uh, and I guess that's also the reason why uh, this last two years I went back to the, his to the history of the Middle East and the history of utopias in the Middle East. Because there was a time in the Middle East where, when even after the independence, when the nation state was not like the horizon, the final horizon of of independence, uh, but more a sort of perception of, um, of the world as a coalition of 
a common share political utopia. And that was enough to, to consider that uh, I can support the, uh, a Vietnamese in his struggle for independence mm -hmm. or um, someone from Mozambique or South Africa in the 60s, etc., etc. et cetera. And of course, the Arab Spring also had an impact on that because I, I, I must say that I was a bit uh, confused by the way it was um, uh, pictured in the media as, a, as the Facebook revolution, mm -hmm. as, if his, uh, as, the, as if the history of revolution in the Arab world needed uh, modern and Western technology to become possible. <laughs> but actually, there's a very long history of revolutionary thinking and progressive thinking in the area. Uh, so I, I, I have dedicated the last three years in somehow investigating on, on, on that history and uh, articulating uh, different moments in the, in the history of the, of the region when that utopia was somehow implemented or discussed, at least discussed in a, in a very concrete way. And um, to answer your question, I'm currently working actually on two, two projects. Uh, one that would be the, the closing chapter somehow on this investigation on the history of Utopia in the Middle East, but more focused on the connection between, it actually starts with Jean Genet, the French writer, and the connection between revolution and poetry. And poetry. And poetry, mm -hmm. because it, there is a connection at least for a poet like uh, Jean Genet. And then other project uh, about theater and community. And again, what would be at stake is the, is the question of belonging and, and the community. What is a community? Uh, and what is a, a community that aims to achieve equality? And of course, this, uh, this re results in many problems including decision-making, et cetera, when you are a group and you want to be equalitarian in the way you function, you have to invent ways of making decisions. So I'm giving here like specific examples, but just to give you an idea of why it, it is also about theater. And it will be filmed in a theater and produced in a theater with non-actors that will form a theater group um, and involving different people from different backgrounds, but it also originates in a, in, a, in a real story. In a real story? Yeah. But I cannot say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I say something yeah, about the Bush's mapping project that I found really moving and effective? So uh, in, in my book, I say that the, the, the modern nation state, the rich Western modern states uh, are like, uh, be, it's, it's a form of feudalism, really, that to be born in a in a rich Western modern state, it's like being born into the nobility in the Middle Ages, and to be born anywhere else in the world is like, even though lots of us are at the lesser nobility, uh, and to be born into, the, into uh, any other place, the poor states, is like being born into the peasantry, even though there are rich peasants and some make it into the nobility. Uh, and, uh, and it's that way because then your life chances are so dependent on where you're born. And, and one of the things that comes out in the mapping project uh, is you can see these are just ordinary people. You know, that the immigrants get constructed as threats and dangerous and trying to take stuff from us. And you can see journey, and, and it's, it's the simplicity of it because you don't know a lot about the stories. You just have the map tracing, but this voice saying, well, I went from here and I was looking for work and I couldn't find work and then I went there. So these are just ordinary people trying to find jobs, trying to make a life for themselves. And, and uh, that just comes out, I think, very vividly in the, kind of, in the, in the way in which the, all these different stories reflect that. And they then call into question the legitimacy of exclusion. Well, what, so why do we get to say no to these people? Why are we entitled to what we have? We, we in the United States and Canada and, and in these European states, well, why do we get to keep them out? What is the foundation for that? And that's what I think kind of comes out in your project. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with your comment. And I, I hoped that this would be un understood when experiencing the, the, the work. Um, because again, what I, what I try to reflect on is this conception of citizenship that originates in the restrictive conception of nation state. Uh, meaning again, the, 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 the citizenship as a sort of VIP area in a big club. Right. Like, that, like there's the club, it's the world, and there's the VIP area, 
And that's the, that's the area where you, you have the right passport and you can travel and, and the others are most of the time at the door and they cannot get in. And like to, to continue your yes. own metaphor yeah. no, no, on I, ability I, and presentry. Right, right. Um, and I became more and more sensitive to, to this. First, as someone who was born as a subject of a king and not as a citizen, because that's technically what we were in, in Morocco until the, the early 2000s. Um, and when I lived in France with a residency permit, I was excluded from the club in many, many different aspects. Uh, even though I was going to the same schools as the others, I was given the same education, I was speaking the same language, I was sharing the same culture, etc., etc., etc. And of course, this was also reflected in the, in the, in the daily discourse of uh, French politicians, as an example. Uh, so one shouldn't be today surprised that Marine Le Pen is so popular, because she's the one who is claiming citizenship as an exclusive club. Like, this should be the privilege of the French only. And therefore, also um, giving legitimacy to a conception of uh, French citizenship that somehow absolutely contradicts the principle of the French Revolution. Right. I was rereading this afternoon the Article 3, I think, of the Constitution of 1793. Uh, that, that was probably the most progressive ever written in that country. And there is one sentence absolutely beautiful that says, uh, whoever, uh, every alien uh, who feed an uh, aged man or an orphan is French. <laughs> That was enough. It was not about being born in France or uh, uh, having spent five years or 10 years or whatever. It was about being a good human being. And that's basically what the next article says. Uh, France can give French citizenship who someone who has demonstrate uh, great uh, humanistic values. But this can be an alien too. Someone living in, I don't know, Morocco or Syria. It can be enough to, to, to become French. So the, the question can be also asked in, in that way, why um, so-called progressive democratic uh, countries uh, became nation state on the basis of very open conception of citizenship and why we end up with the complete opposite. Uh, somehow you, 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 you answered the question before when you mentioned the, somehow the instrumentalization of, uh, of citizenship for short-term political agenda uh, by politicians in, in many Western countries. Um, there is a wonderful essay by French historian Patrick Veil on the history of it's French citizenship. Yeah. yeah, it's extraordinary how it was instrumentalized yes. throughout the, the late 19th century and 20th century. Um, and one also understands that there is a sort of opportunistic uh, agenda in granting citizenship to foreigners and suddenly making it more difficult to, to the exactly same people uh, and even worse during World War II because thousands of French were not French citizens at all anymore um, even though they were for decades. I mean there is something uh, there is something to be said for what's happening in Europe in particular. Um, the instrumentalization of and, and the description of the immigrant um, and the refugee in particular as a real threat to national identity, to, uh, to the, the collective, you know, the co collectivity. Um, speaking from the Middle East, you see that for countries like Turkey, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, even Saudi Arabia has taken in several hundred thousand Syrians. And whilst um, these Syrian refugees in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, so on, are not necessarily treated well. They're not given citizenship rights or even civil rights often. But they're not, uh, the, the state doesn't use them as a foil to, to, to construct a sense of identity, an exclusive sense of identity in opposition to them. Um, and it's, it's curious that that's not the case in the Middle East, given that they're taking in many more than Europe uh, is. So, so this is, a, I, for me, a, 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 you know, Leah mentioned it in the opening conversation. You just brought it up again. It's one of the things that drops out in the conversation on refugees. So if you look about the debate on refugees, people are saying, well, we can't take so many in, in Europe, in the United States, so 10,000, that would be too many. And 
Lebanon has over a million. Yeah, Lebanon one, has four uh, million almost, people and yeah. has over a million refugees. Yeah. So, so this idea that it's too many we can't manage, uh, what is it that people imagine who say that is going to happen to these refugees? Do they think they should die? And if not, who should take care of them? And why should Lebanon take care of them, or Turkey, or Jordan? Uh, so there's some refusal to contemplate the implications. This is where I like to kind of think through the implications. So if you're saying this, what does that imply for what should happen to these refugees? Who is responsible? And why do we assume that these states, as you say, the states in the Middle East, which are not our models, they are often uh, undemocratic and they are repressive in various ways, but they're the ones who are admitting the refugees and if not treating them perfectly, admitting them and taking care of them. And the rich Western liberal democratic states are excluding them. So I think that's a deep puzzle and contradiction in the values that we claim to profess. Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely true. But I, I think, I mean, I suspect that the answer to why that is, it has to do with politics. It doesn't have to do the with... The answer has to do with privilege, right? That yeah. what people feel is that if we, that we will have to give up some of the privileges that we enjoy, and that is true. So if you accept this model of feudalism, the nobility has to give up some of its privileges. Yes, we cannot enjoy all of the privileges that we have, in a just world. A just world will be a more egalitarian world. And, and so in a just world, there won't, people won't need to leave home to find work because there will be the opportunities will be more widely distributed. But with, there's a kind of refusal to acknowledge our role in maintaining this present order. If you, so notice even in your comments, you know, we presuppose, and that's one of the things that, that Bushra's uh, mapping project undermines, we talk about states, so Syria does this, Jordan does this. So it presupposes states and their existence and they make sense. They're, they're, they, we take those as given entities. You can't, of course you have to assume that. Well, it is a deep feature of the modern world. I don't mean to deny that, of course, but there's a way in which, you know, one of the things one wants to do is to problematize that. Well, why do these matter? And if we want to defend organizing the world into states, uh, what is the story we tell as to why that's good for everybody, not just good for us? It's never a good moral argument to say, this is good for us. Well, you have to say it's good for everybody, right? There has to be some story, and there isn't a good story to tell about that. And that would be true geopolitics. Yeah. And not uh, what we have seen these last years, that also uh, conducted to what is going on in Syria and other areas of the, of the region. When, when you speak of acknowledging the situation, there is also a need to acknowledge the, the, the consequences of geopolitical agendas that are operated and, and conducted in very specific areas to uh, lead directly to the disasters that we, ha we, we have been seeing in Iraq actually from 1991. Right. If we were honest, we won't speak only from 2003 because between 2001 and 2003, there were still a lot of Iraqi refugees that were, were leaving uh, Iraq out of the consequence of the 91 war. And I met a lot of them in Istanbul in 2006-07, uh, who left Iraq in 96, 95, 94. Um, so speaking of equality is also speaking of ge geopolitics in its uh, true yeah. Yeah, and essential uh, form and not as a form of opportunistic and cynical diplomacy uh, that operates for very short-term agenda and uh, just leave the consequences to the, to the neighboring area, to, the, to those areas that were destroyed. Because uh, that's also what happened in Iraq and Syria, just to give those examples. So I have a couple of questions. <laughs> One has to do with you know, the individuals that you, that you, you know, spoke to and how you got them to say, tell their stories, so the mechanics of it. But before I get into that, I, I'm wondering about the, again, you know, in a way your, your interrogation, your questions are also a representation of, 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 of the situation. That, that I know that they were done before the Arab Spring, but really they could have been done after the Arab Spring. They could have been done almost at any time because the, the story of these, re of, of these people trying to leave, you know, is decades old, um, even from the regions where, where you're, uh, where that they, they've come from. Um, so, so in terms of, you know, in a sense, giving them voice, representing them, 
there's something, that, to me at least, that the artist does, and certainly in your case, it's almost uh, prescient. You know, you almost put your finger on something, uh, on a problem uh, that exists, and told, this, told the, the story of this problem in a way that hasn't been told by anyone else, certainly not by the media. There's something almost, um, you know, as I said, prescient. All, you know, you could tell that this was a problem that's very major in the world today, and you could tell that story in a way that I think is much more effective than other ways of telling it that, are, that, that we hear about typically from, from, from the media. And so the role of the artist in that, in, that, in that telling, if you can maybe say something about whether you think you, you know, you put your finger on something in a very particular way, how is it that you even came up with this idea? I mean, did you, you notice it from Morocco and it was something that you experienced yourself, so you wanted to reproduce it through these individuals as well, or was it something else? Mm. Again, I cannot make a short answer to yeah, this one. <laughs> I'm sorry to be asking these big questions. <laughs> there are many yeah. things behind it. Um, even when I was in the art school in Paris, uh, I was working on the, the question of, of, being, of not being a citizen and being um, um, somehow excluded to the margin of society because you don't, you don't hold the right papers. Right. Um, so I, I, I guess it's something to which I, I, have, always, I have always been very attentive. Um, my own situation was different because I was a student uh, and I moved with my parents and I was very lucky because often it's also a complete matter of luck. The first time I went to France, I was three months old and this day, in the archives. <laughs> so when I applied for uh, um, a residency permit, they saw that I already came, that there was a connection. So it makes things easier. But what yeah. about if the law, a different law, was voted two sure. days before, mm -hmm. uh, as Patrick Veil demonstrated in, in his book? It was at that time. It was it was easier. Today it would be impossible. It would mm -hmm. never happen. Mm -hmm. But 20 years ago it was possible for someone like me to not face that many difficulties in getting a residency permit was what was much more difficult is to apply for French citizenship. That was another story, mm -hmm. which I won't tell tonight because it's too long. <laughs> but, um, to go back to your, to your question, I, I cannot answer to it in a simple way because I cannot say I have uh, experienced this myself the same way. It's not true. Uh, what I have experienced in is witnessing this in my uh, environment. And every single Moroccan know a lot of people who cross the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, more or less the way it is described in the video. Mm -hmm. So it is something that became somehow almost part of our culture. And it created a form of popular culture <laughs> with songs, mm -hmm. uh, jokes, tales, uh, um, music. Um, it, it, it is. Uh, uh, almost a sort of culture, you know, this, because it was massive in the, in the early 90s until the early 2000s. Um, so, so the journey. Yeah, right? living. Yeah, leaving. In, in Morocco, we say burning. Burning. Yeah, because you, you burn the border. I see. In hmm. Derija, in the yeah. dialectal Arabic, yeah, you, or he's a burner. He burned last night. That's basically what we, we, we used to hear every, almost every day. Ah, you know, uh, Mohammed, he burnt last night. Or th that, that was really in our environment. So, uh, of course, this creates another perception of crossing borders uh, illegally, uh, not to mention the history of immigration that is completely linked to it, and the mythology of immigration in North Africa that is very strong. Um, because there is a huge diaspora from Morocco, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, literally all over the, the world. And this also participate in that culture that I tried to uh, describe before. Um, I'm not sure actually if, if I'm answering your question, but I'm trying to connect very complex things together that som somehow in which uh, that work in particular originate. Um, 
but to say it in more simple words, I worked with what I know. Uh, and I worked also with what I researched, because I, there, there is also a lot of research uh, behind it, uh, which I conducted out of, uh, let's say, um, like, because I like making my homework, so I know a bit what I'm talking about. And, and of course, I was also dealing with different contexts, so uh, uh, it was important to have a sort of precise knowledge of specific situations. Um, and, the, and the visual aspect, I, I described it before, so it, it gives an idea of how of all those things combined. combined. Um, but it's also the same methodology I, 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 I use for all of my projects, uh, always working with things I have experienced or know or that was in my uh, uh, environment, including the ones on the history of uh, Ethiopia in the Middle East. It was also stories I have heard when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X in Algiers, the Black Panthers mm -hmm. at the Pan-African Festival, mm -hmm. the uh, African National Congress headquarters that was located in, Ra in Rabat, Morocco, 19, until 1962. So I always work with things that I, I have heard or that I know about that was in my environment. And I research, too. And somehow, uh, all of this becomes a sort of, um, stays in my head, uh, but is not any more important when, when I'm on the, on, on the site, when it's happening. And uh, to answer your other question about uh, how it happened that I met so many individuals who uh, told me their stories. Uh, it's just that we talked a lot together. So the, the videos are not based on interviews. There's no cuts, there's no questions being asked simultaneously as the, as the, as the filming. It was very long conversations, and I think throughout those conversations there was also a form of empowerment that was developing uh, because they were somehow becoming the, the author of their own story. Right. It was not being told by someone else. It was being told by themselves. So they, they yeah, they, there was also a form of empowerment in that. So I would like to remind the audience that you can ask questions. And I think there are cards that are amongst you um, that are, have been distributed. So please do so. Um, write out your questions. And um, Bushra, I know you wanted to show a few slides to. Not necessarily. I, I, I mean, we can keep talking. I also find it very nice just to have this conversation it's, and to talk. It's, it's really up to you if you. No, I'm, I'm totally yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. I mean, if, I wanted to. You, you had mentioned earlier that you didn't think that um, social media, the internet, um, you know, Facebook, etc., all these things had had um, Thank you. really played such an important role, I think, in the context of the Arab Spring. Um, I, I, I haven't said that. <laughs> OK, well, but that they had, but you said that you know, there were revolutionary ideas and, and, and connections that predated uh, social media. I wonder, though, uh, how you think uh, these technologies are, um, and, and this question goes to you as well. Um, how these technologies may or may not alter um, the the stories of some of these people who are uh, you know who are refugees. Uh, whether I mean I know that in, if I recall correctly, in some of your um, in some in in your installation, there were accounts of people saying you know uh, I was able to call my mother, I was able to you know maybe you know uh, FaceTime her or, or whatever I, you know so. In, in what ways do these technologies make a difference? I mean, are they, for instance, you know, helping attenuate or make less uh, imposing the nation, the, you know, the, the power of the nation state, the, the 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 overwhelming sort of oppressiveness of the of the nation state? Do you find that in any way they 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 play a role or or not? Thank you. You want to take this one, Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, I guess one thing to say is that I do think that the, the phenomenon of migration, of course, it's an old phenomenon, yeah. but it has been accelerated by uh, technology. And that's not just the, this kind of communication technology, though that is part of it. Because now, 
uh, everybody understands the possibilities out there. There's this global communication and people have pictures and they have understandings and they have communications and they have networks. And so this sense th that there's a possibility to move if you want to uh, is, I think, enhanced by technology. And of course, then the physical possibilities of moving are enhanced by modern means of transportation. So, so that is, you know, that's you know, a simple point about globalization and, and the way in which that connects people together economically, socially, culturally, that, that certainly has an impact in challenging and then making people nervous about their understanding of their, what their community is and membership in the community and, 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 and outsiders. So yeah, I think it's a relevant. And in, in connection with the uh, string, of, of course, uh, social media were extremely important because, um, I mean, one of their initial vocation is to allow uh, to communities to to exist or to invent other communities. So, strategically speaking, it was extremely important in Syria and in other in other countries. Maybe not as important in Tunisia because the the demonstrations were so immense. Uh, um, so, if if they are. Uh, maybe producing a sort of almost uh, ep ep epistemological shift, it is in the conception of the community that doesn't need to be physically present in one space, uh, but that can exist and be effective in a, in a vi virtually, in a virtual space, and that space will still have an impact on the reality. Uh, maybe it is in that, in that connection, in that, um, way from the virtual community to the physical, political community that becomes visible on the, on the, on the streets. Um, so when I said that Facebook <laughs> uh, or the Arab Spring doesn't originate in Facebook, no. it was historically speaking. No. It was bec because the, the, the history of those uh, uh, revolutions in the, in the region were also present in the demonstrations. Uh, to, to give you an example, I made in 2014 a work based on the, on the encounter of Abdel Karim Al Khattabi and Che Guevara in 59. Mm. Uh, that really happened, but that was never documented. And well, what surprised me a lot is when I started seeing in demonstrations in Morocco uh, pictures of Al Khattabi. Mm. And same in Paris a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, in October, there was a demonstration against racism and for equality, and there were pictures of Al Khattabi too. Um, and this is not the, the the result of Facebook; it's the result of the reconnection with history. Um, yeah. So we have a number of questions, by the way, from the audience. So, um, if you, I'll I'll start with one that's actually addressed to you, Bushra. And this is uh, a question that says, do you see the artist as being necessarily progressive? That's a very good question. Um, well, I think history has, has shown us that not all of the artists are progressive. Uh, no, I, I don't believe that an artist has to be necessarily progressive. Uh, or being a, a good artist necessarily means, to, or if you are a good artist, it's because you are progressive. Uh, no, not, not really. There are great artists who I personally admire as artists, not as human beings, <laughs> who, have pro who are not progressive. But what they, they, they have done in art should, still deserve to be acknowledged as good art, even though they were not progressive. Um, so this is a question that may go to you, actually. Uh, so one is, uh, the, so the, 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 the first question, there are several actually here, but I'll, I'll just ask one. The, parallel, the parallels between today's refugee uh, issues or crisis and the Holocaust certainly may exist, but there is a critical underlying difference. Today's refugees largely come from uh, political systems or political belief systems that seek to do dominate others. Uh, Jews, however, only wanted to survive and assimilate. The excessive accommodation of refugee demands is suicidal for open Western countries. How do you balance Western values with refugee demands? So, you know, 
one of the problems with this sort of question is uh, one asks about what is the empirical evidence? And if one looks at uh, the facts over the last, uh, they've recently cited this, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of refugees admitted to the United States over the past 20, 30 years, and four incidents of terrorism. So there's just no reason to believe so again, I think Bushra's story captures it nicely, her mapping journey. You know, these, the vast majority of refugees, what do they want? They, they want their children to be safe. They want to find a place where they can live a life, grow up with their kids, uh, have, have a job, and live a normal life. And so the idea that somehow, be, so some come from repressive regimes, but the, the, the fact that the idea that they would then want to reinstitutionalize those repressive regimes, I think, is just without foundation. Not to say nobody, but almost nobody. And the idea that we should exclude millions of people for the sake of the one or two, poss the, the possibility of a few, is just inhumane. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I absolutely agree with you, too, because. Um, if, if one makes the hypothesis that they are leaving oppressive regimes to re-implement this oppressive regime elsewhere, then it means that they are not refugees, but that they have a plan. Right. And, and we see time and again, you know, it's, 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 I saw something, somebody had said, you know, people do not put their kids in boats unless, the, you know, being on a boat is less dangerous than being on the land. These people are not fleeing to dominate others. They are fleeing to save their lives. So it's just unreasonable to construct them in this way. And to give an, an example that is probably not uh, absolutely relevant for all the situations that are occurring today with regards to the uh, migration crisis, but uh, as an example, in, in North Africa, again, I speak of what I know uh, from experience leaving the country uh, without a visa was also a form of protest against the regime, but also against uh, uh, the restrictive laws that banned millions of people to, to, to travel freely and to make a life of their own where they want to live. Uh, so they, they, there is also a form of, I, I won't call it a political statement at all because it's not the case. Uh, but as, as, as you said, no one risks his or her life and the life of, of their kids uh, to implement an oppressive regime elsewhere. It is to live, to simply live, uh, not to become a millionaire or whatever, but to have a decent life and, and, and a life where respect is, is guaranteed, but also liberty. Uh, and that's also the, the difference between as being uh, like in Lebanon or Jordan or uh, Turkey and being in Germany, mostly Germany, I must say, in, in, in Europe. In, in one case, there are many restrictions to your own liberties in being a refugee there. Um, and that's also the reason why, um, I mean, if you take the risk to, to to, or if you are ready to risk your life to, because it's a matter of survival, um, liberty is also somehow at stake. Absolutely. Can I, can I say one yeah. other quick thing? Sure. That question said, oh, well, Jews are just leaving to assimilate. But that, that way of phrasing it forgets all of the anti-Semitic tropes, which said that, no, Jews were bent on domination. So if you think of all the justifications that were offered for excluding Jews, it was precisely that this false construction that they were bent on domination. And I think the same, so that's again where these tropes are repeated today, but okay. now with respect to the Muslims. So um, we have one more question here, um, and I'm gonna add to it a little bit. <laughs> uh, so uh, did you have to choose between which refugee stories to tell and display? And if so, how did you choose? And I'm adding to it, um, I recall was it one woman or maybe more? There, at least one was a woman. And the, could you speak a little bit about the difference between the, the males versus the females in, in the story, in the narrative? Because I imagine being a woman, like I think it was a Somali woman in that case. I mean, the experience of traveling must have been you know, harrowing. It's harrowing for all of them, but that much more so for her. Um, so if you, could, if you could say something about that. Well, actually, um, there was no casting. 
and right. there, there are no videos that we have that we have filmed and that are not being shown there. All of them are there, and and I I I, I have not selected uh, because it was not what was at stake. What was at stake was meeting an individual, and not uh, and going back to the media uh, uh, question. It is somehow the opposite of looking for good examples, mm -hmm. because there are no good examples. Every single life deserves, or every single trajectory deserves to be told, because they are all singular. And because they are singular, they are universal. That, that was my bet, somehow. Um, so no, they are all there. Um, speaking of the, of the video with the young woman from Somalia, um, I think, um, of course, I, I was very um, touched by her. But she's a very strong woman, really impressive, extremely strong. Um, but she was also protected by other Somali men. Huh. And uh, going back to the previous question and the answer you gave, to, you, you, you gave to it, there is also in Europe a very popular uh, complotist uh, theory. Conspiracy. Uh, yeah, conspiracy. conspiracy sorry. Um, called Arabia that there is a plan, Arabs have, have a plan to invade Europe and to submit Europeans to Islam. That woman was protected by uh, older men, not very older, but older, um, and they uh, made sure that she would arrive safe, and they were traveling together. Uh, she was not oppressed by them, uh, or nothing of this. Uh, she, she was in a group that left Somalia together, and she was the only woman, and she was perfectly safe among those, uh, among those men. Mm -hmm. So there, there was no uh, like, uh, stereotype on the typical uh, Muslim or Arab um, uh, conception of a uh, woman that is necessarily inferior or uh, whatever, absolutely not. Uh, and the, and, and the, yeah, she was among a community of men. Another one is, uh, what has changed in the refugees' visibility in the media or elsewhere since you made these works uh, between 2008 and 2011? Um, that's a very good question. Um, actually, I, I, I I think if we speak of visibility, uh, then it, it, um, the, the channels should be specified. Yes, the uh, migration crisis is discussed every single day in the media. Um, but it is also discussed by the politicians in Europe and also here. I, I heard that Donald Trump made some comments on his views on, on, on migrations. Can we call it visibility? I'm not sure. What is certainly visible is certain discourses. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, the, that, they are, that they are visibles. That the individuals uh, that are uh, suffering uh, uh, the conditions of being forced to cross illegally borders is visible. Uh, and therefore, one can also ask an, an other question, until what point this should be visible too, somehow. Um, because speaking of the visibility or the non-visibility of the, of the refugees is, um, doesn't answer the question of why are they forced to experience this very hard uh, uh, life that, that can span for literally years for, for some of them. So, um, I'm not sure if, uh, let's say, uh, humanitarian um, uh, comments are enough to make visible a question or, or, or an issue. Because eventually what is, what is at stake is, again, equality. Until what point are we ready to accept an other that can be, that can be radically other? 
or that can embody a certain type of otherness that is not popular in the, in the country or what, whatsoever. And of course, I have in mind the, the very specific context of Germany and France, which I know well because I, I, I have lived in both places. Um, and this also affects the visibility or non-visibility uh, of, the, of the individuals who are forced to cross illegally borders. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but it's a very difficult question to answer because visibility can mean many, many different things. At least for me, what should be visible is their own views. The views and the perspective of the individuals uh, who are experiencing this crisis in, in their life that really impact their life for, for, for real. Um, and how are we, are we ready to shift our perspective on otherness, but also on equality? So, I, I mean, I would just say that it seems to me that Bushra's project is to render people visible who are not, right? That is, that's what the mapping journey does, is to kind of uh, make it possible to see people in a certain kind of way who normally just uh, are unseen, just constructed. So they're visible in one sense as objects, as threats, as, as, as depersonalized others, and then you have a project that tries to uh, make you see them as human beings. So we have a question. I think this one is addressed to you. Um, so this question says, Commitment to a society as a basis of citizenship is a lovely idea. On the flip side, the anxiety or suspicion about refugees and economic migrants comes from a suspicion of this commitment. In other words, whether they're committed to, to this notion of a society. Do we need to think of these categories separately at, when considering immigration? I guess the category of, of refugee immigrant. versus economic migrant. Yeah. So I guess I would, in answering that question, distinguish two levels of thought. So if you were asking, as a kind of practical policy matter today, should we try to distinguish between economic migrants and refugees, I think it does make sense to distinguish between those who have an urgent need for safety, for their basic safety and protection of their human rights to gain entry, between other people who have a a life and they're trying to better themselves. Those are not the same situation and we do need to make distinctions. But it's also important to step back from, and, and that's in a kind of context where we're accepting the existing background framework in place, but it's also important to step back and criticize that framework. I guess that one of the, one of the things that I'm trying to get people to think about is the, the fundamental background structure of the way we've organized the world and to see that that is deeply unjust and in a just world, this, this difference would disappear because people would not feel the need to leave, either because they were being driven out as refugees or because they had a need to move elsewhere uh, for economic reasons. That in a, there's no reason in principle why we couldn't organize the world in a just way so that people had decent opportunities at home. Then if they wanted to move, then they could have the freedom to move if they wanted to. Most people probably wouldn't because most people want to live where they grow up, where they have family, where they know language, where they have cultural roots. That's the way most people want to live, but then some people want to move for one reason or another, and their movement would not be a problem if they weren't being, if so many didn't have urgent other needs to move. So I think that's what's at the heart of the problem. So you make a distinction between economic migrants and refugees. Well, I think there is a continuum that, that, that uh, you recognize that there are people there are people who are being bombed. So if they don't get to leave, they will die. And other people, uh, the, so if we look in the United States, for example, most of the people who come from Mexico to the United States, who I think ought to receive legal status, they ought to be regularized, but in most cases, they would not die living in Mexico. They would simply have a more limited life. And they come to create a better life for themselves and their children. They're seeking some kind of opportunity that they don't have at home which I think is a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do. But their need to be outside their country of origin isn't as urgent and dire as the need of some people who really can't survive without it. So I think we have to recognize that distinction, yeah. 
you don't. Bernard, <laughs> <laughs> should we say one more question? Yeah. Um, I have made the work here in 2013 that is part of a series called the Speeches Series that is actually about citizenship, and it's a, it's a trilogy. The first one was made in Paris, the second in, in, Ge in Genoa, Italy, and the, the third here. And the third was about the articulation between uh, labor and, uh, and citizenship. And the, the, the whole piece, it's a video work, is structured around um, somehow public speech given by what is defined today as undocumented workers, mm -hmm. few of them being from Mexico, mm -hmm. and defining other forms of citizenship based on their belonging to the workforce. It, it, and one of them uh, specifically says something that I find personally very powerful. Uh, even though he's undocumented, he considers that he belongs to, to, to this community because his political consciousness grew up here. So um, I agree with that, though. But, but I, in saying that I think you have to distinguish, it doesn't mean that the people who have come here and settled here as undocumented workers are not members or don't belong or don't have a right to sit, which I, I think they do. They have a right to get legal status and, and to get citizenship. It just has to do with the urgency of people who are now outside. What is the relative urgency of people who are currently outside? I think we can distinguish between different conditions. But the people who are already here, they're members from my point of view and they ought to be accepted. So I agree with that. Good. Um, maybe one last question. So this, again, um, is a question that's, that says, why isn't there more focus directed on the people or leaders who are responsible for creating refugees rather than the refugees themselves? In other words, on the systems that produce this, this well, problem. Well, again, I think the, you know, the story of one of the things, one of the arguments you heard in the 1930s was, you know, admitting Jewish refugees will not solve the problem of Hitler. And that's true. It wouldn't. And so, of course, the problem is the leaders and the repressive regimes that are generating these refugees. But the question is, what are you going to do with the people who are suffering? That's simply, you can't finesse that problem and you can't expect, there's nothing to be gained by making do you want Syrians to stay and be bombed by Assad? And is that somehow going to do something to remove Assad from power? I, I don't think so. Please uh, join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>